Okay, so um, without much further ado, my, my uh, topic of discussion is uh, about Richard Sudell, who, as you can see there, I am, I am uh, calling the forgotten man of 20th century garden and landscape history. Um, and, uh, and, and obviously my title here is Confluence of the Times, which I hope will become clear as we, uh, as we, as we go through. Um, what, what I would say is that, that um, my background, I, I'm fully aware, looking at some of the names that I saw in the visitor room there, that there's a lot of very esteemed and, and, and expert um, garden and landscape uh, historians. So I feel a little bit uh, nervous, a little bit trepidatious, um, but, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll plow on. Um, my, uh, I did a master's in landscape and garden history at the Institute of Historical Research last year. Um, and graduated in December, a fantastic time. Uh, and Richard Sudell has become my hero and was the subject of my dissertation. By background, I'm not an academic, I'm a journalist, I'm a former newspaper editor, so you might see a bit of journalism creeping in that might make some of you academics shudder, but so I apologize in advance for that. Like everybody, very quickly, but what, what I'm gonna try and do today is just sketch out a little bit of Richard Sudell's life for you, because I think it's really important uh, to explain why I believe he's a forgotten man and also why it's time that we should um, uh, uh, to bring him back to life, if you like, as a really key uh, person in early 20th century garden history. Uh, something which really most of you know isn't really tackled very much. And actually, that was one of the things I, I found. That, that, that there aren't many people writing even now about that period of time in garden and landscape history. Like everybody else, when I started uh, thinking about um, uh, why I wanted to do garden, uh, uh, landscape and garden history at the IHR. It was mainly about all the other reasons of antiquarian gardens, picturesque and, uh, and all the rest of it that, that, uh, you know, that, that most people associate with that sort of thing. And instead of which I ended up looking at quail cast mowers, garden centers, gnomes and metro land uh, with my friend um, Richard Sudell. And I think what, 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 I, what, I, what I claim to have done is no more, no less than what any journalist would do, which is stumble on a, a, a decent garden history story, I would say. A story that's really redolent of the period in garden and landscape history, and I hope you agree. So I will outline his life uh, and his garden philosophy um, as quickly as I can. Um, I'll talk about his role uh, in the ILA, um, uh, Institute of Landscape Architect, where obviously the now it's called the Landscape Institute. And I will maybe look about why Richard Sudell didn't fit in and why he has become forgotten. Because I will argue that Richard Sudell was the founder of the ILA and is the founder of the organization that many of you know today and whose archive is there, and which, you know, not for any fault of the Institute itself, hasn't, doesn't have that much in him. In fact, in some ways you could say the ILA itself has virtually airbrushed Richard Sudell out of its history. Um, um, and there's the journalist in me. Um, so um, if we go first to today, this is a quote from Historic England um, uh, who has listed the one remaining garden left that Richard Sudell designed. Very untypical, the biggest um, um, uh, work he did, because we don't know much about uh, the rest of his work. Um, but as you see that quote from Historic England there, um, it says, one of the limited number of schemes known to survive by Richard Sudell, an important and influential figure in the development of mid 20th century landscape design and a pioneering theorist, writer, and advocate of the profession. Now, it's about time, you might argue. This is Dolphin Square in, um, in uh, uh, Pimlico. Um, currently under threat of redevelopment, which would take away half of this garden. The um, Westminster City Council uh, Planning Committee have rejected the application by Westover um, Holdings to, to bulldoze some of this stuff and build it and lose Sudell's garden, but there is an appeal coming forward. And I must say, I must pay tremendous credit to Annabelle Downs here, both for being the first person in the footsteps to look at Richard Sudell and also for, for really playing a key part in trying to save this magnificent garden. But I think it's the first time that Richard Sudell has actually ever been given the, 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 uh, the credit he deserves. So wh why, why was I interested in it? Um, it was certainly out of my comfort zone, this, 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 this degree. And the only thing I knew about Richard Sudell was a very oblique reference that he lived on this estate. This is the Roehampton estate, now known as the Dover House estate in London. Um, and it's, it, it, as part of the course, it was mentioned that, that there was a journalist who wrote for the Parish Pump magazine. Well, given that I was out of my comfort zone, this was a potential effort to jump straight back into it. And what we saw and what we started to see, even though I not was not really interested in this period of history at the time, was that swirl of one man and a swirl of history 
uh, into war gardens. These, this was the time of homes fit for heroes, the mass building of council and private estates, taking people out of the slums, giving people gardens for the first time. And of course, with many, many thousands of people not really knowing, to, not, not knowing what, what to do with those. Um, this was an at London County Council cottage estate. This is where it's uh, a picture of it being built at the time. And as I say, Richard Sudell moved in here um, straight after the First World War and began what I think is a deep down in the soil um, uh, 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 approach to, to gardens and why I think he is, uh, he is such a remarkable figure. So who is he? This is Richard with his second wife, Ida. Um, he was a fellow journalist. Um, and as I said before, um, you know, he, living on that estate, very hard to find out what he did, other than that, that I knew from Annabelle, that, uh, who'd written for the, uh, Ash, uh, the Oxford um, uh, Dictionary of National Biography, that he was a prodigious author uh, of garden instruction books uh, and, and many other things that Annabelle had, had, had found. So I thought this was, my, this was my man and I would go on the chase. And never ever underestimate the power of social media. These, are, these people here sitting in Dolphin Square are Richard Sudell's granddaughters. And uh, I found them due to the power of Instagram. The lady on the, the left as you look is Jane van den Broek. Her son, Richard's great grandson, is Theo van der Broek, who is the fashion editor of GQ and Esquire magazine. And one day Instagrammed a picture of Richard and said, don't know much about him, but this is my great uh, grandfather. Um, and I happened to stumble upon it. And so when you start talking, as all good journalists do and all good researchers do, to these people, I found them via Theo. Um, and then a story of Richard emerged that was, I was able to build on from the great work that Annabelle had done. We knew that he was a very, came from a poor family in Lancashire, started as a gardener at the age of 14, had managed to get himself through, lot, through many, many trials and tribulations to uh, become an apprentice gardener at Kew just before the start of the Second World War, and then disappeared off the scene, really. Um, and when I spoke to the Sudell family, um, one of them, not all of them knew this, happened to mention that Richard Sudell was a conscientious objector in the First World War. Um, again, that's a sniff of a good line of a story for me. Um, and you've George Bernard Shaw and all this sort of stuff. So suddenly, Richard Zudell is put in, the, in a position of being a gardener, uh, of being interested in the swirl of politics at that time. And, and suddenly, that was a brilliant rocket fuel for me to carry on with my research. And so another great thing that all journalists and all researchers do, of course, is enlist a whole host of people to help them do the work. Um, and Cyril Pierce is a remarkable guy who um, has, has single-handedly put together the entire conscientious objector uh, list that is now at the Imperial War Museum. Um, and uh, this came via him. Richard Sudell, turns out, was a very, very strong conscientious objector. Um, he was arrested, having fled from Kew Gardens to, to go back to Woodbrook and went to Woodbrook College. Those of you who know Woodbrook will know that um, it is the former home of Quaker George Cadbury, right in slap bang in the middle of his cottage estate at Bourneville. So Richard Sudell is A, fleeing uh, conscription and is also moving into uh, a place where the ethos and the philosophy of that time in terms of garden and cottage cities, um, space and open air and all the rest of that, uh, that, that sort of moral obligation that people like Cadbury had is starting to swirl around. Um, and so what you see here is a first-hand account of some of the things that Richard Sudell was saying about why he, um, he uh, was a conscious objector. Absolute gold dust for me. Not much about gardening just yet, as, as Barbara Sims, my, my tutor, was often telling me. But um, that quote there is about how he refused to work at work centres, which were alternatives for, for, to prison. Um, so you see this holder culture um, and, uh, a, 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 and ideology coming together with him. Um, and he was sent to solitary confinement uh, for, for, for this period. And anyone who now knows, like I do, what solitary confinement meant for a CO in those days was incredibly brutal. He was uh, jailed for three times. Uh, he deserted during the war and was captured again, uh, mentioned in the, in the police gazette. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, those days, COs, as you probably know, um, were in solitary confinement, no mattresses, selling, uh, sewing mail bags, no one else to, to, to talk about. This is a letter I found in the, uh, uh, from, uh, to, to, a, to an MP from a, from a lady. Edmund Harvey was a Quaker MP who took up a lot of cases um, about uh, 
uh, conscientious objectors. And here you see is her spelling out what uh, Richard Sudell's views were on the war at that time. I, I, I could never, I don't think Richard was a Quaker. I think he was a socialist. And I think now I think that, and I think, you know, Quakers and socialists obviously joined together quite a lot in that time. And, and what happened when he went on furlough was straight away because of his training as a horticulturist, he went to work for the Vacant Land Cultivation Society set up by American philanthropist in London to bring back um, vacant land for the use of for food and for, for poorer people in London during the war. And this was a recurring theme throughout Richard Sudell's life, that, um, that land for food and land for all and egalitarian stuff, that, that, that access to land was, um, was really important to him when he came out. Um, he joined the London Gardens Guild um, with its inner city window box competitions. He was a secretary of the Prison Gardeners Association, the National Allotments Association, and its, its incentive on food production, which was absolutely crucial to Richard. Um, and so again, you start to see that merging of horticulture and politics uh, swirling around at that time. Um, and as I say, coming out of, um, out of prison, he had to start somewhere else, again, like all CEOs did, 15,000 uh, of them in the, at the end of the First World War. And so back to Roehampton uh, very quickly, um, and again, a bit of luck, really. Um, Jackie Savage is the secretary of the Roehampton Garden Society, which is actually the, the society that Richard Sudell founded. Uh, when he moved to Roehampton, anonymous fresh start on one of these LCC uh, estates. Um, and when I went to see her, she said, well, I don't know anything about Richard Sudell. And you know, I thought that thereby when the trail went dead until she came back about a month later and said in the attic, she'd found all of the minutes of the Roehampton Garden Society uh, from its, um, from its uh, foundation in 1922 when Sudell assumed the, um, the, the chair. And what you get here is a treasure trove of, of uh, you know, that, 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 that proves that Sudell's worth was his role deep down in the soil of new practice, where these people that, that, that were on the estate had never had gardens before, really didn't know what to do with them. As I say, he was elected chairman of the first Roehampton Garden Society in 1922. And these minutes show he went straight into agitating the LCC for more trees to be planted, writing letters about stuff, and working like, as you see that quote there, since there were no funds, the committee gratefully accepted the offer of Mr. Sudell to type out 600 letters informing annual members of the AGM. Absolutely evangelical in his role uh, down uh, uh, there. And, and, and you start to look at why he was different, perhaps. And, and I do stress, by the way, I am no expert on any other people other than maybe Richard Sudell. But I do think there are some clues here about why he, he was um, uh, different. He was getting his hands dirty for the cause. And I can say literally there without being, without being wrong. And here is that Parish Pump magazine, the Roehampton Estate, Estate Gazette. Richard wrote from it from 1922 to 1926. That was two years after he left. So his, 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 you know, his, his need to keep pushing people to do stuff, to beautify their gardens. His words are just like they are all the way through his life. Gently encouraging, extremely, painfully, eye-wateringly practical. Um, talking about archways and, and, and gasoline for green fly, and, and starting to talk about what he understood about gardens and why they were, what they were for, for these working class people on this estate. And that was really, and the words he used time and time again was from exclusion from the world and the turmoil of the day. That was something that was to bring him in the crosshairs of people later on. And that's what he understood from his own experience, that people like these people at Roehampton wanted for their gardens. And, and it's just brilliant. It's brilliant parish pump stuff, as you can see. Richard got into, um, uh, uh, you know, organising flower shows, lectures, garden fates. There's brilliant stuff in his archive about money going missing from the Aunt Sally stand, which meant the Garden Estate Society was in, in trouble. And there's also details of how Richard Sudell received a standing ovation at the Community Award when he talked about progress to making a garden. A standing ovation. Um, and, and as I say, it shows to me, the practical steps that were happening after the First World War uh, to bring gardens to the fore, housing estates bursting into colour and the beautification of Britain growing inch by hard dug inch. Um, and so Richard had written that Parish Pump magazine and had written the town out of, out of the estate, had written something called the Town Gardener's Handbook, which according to the estate sold like hand uh, sorry, hot cakes and had to be um, reprinted. Off the back of that, he got the first garden uh, job at Ideal Home when it was launched. This curious mix of aspirational houses and really practical for the aspiring middle-class suburbanite 
uh, and a very practical gardening column. Um, until the late 1950s, Richard Sudell wrote a column for Ideal Home about gardening. And the owners of Ideal Home then took over the Daily Herald in 1933. And Richard moved straight, as well as staying to write for the Ideal Home, straight to go uh, and write for the Daily Herald. At that time, it was the largest selling newspaper, almost entirely working class people. And he wrote to two million readers every week. And when we look back on garden influences at that time, was there anyone more influential, could be a question, uh, about uh, a garden writer for, for working classes at this time? Very arguable and very questionable, I'd say, if anyone at that time was having that much effect on working class new gardeners than Richard Sudell. Um, and as I said, Annabelle had already, uh, and Richard started in this career to write, 40, he wrote 47 gardening books. And by the time I was into my research, this picture, pictures like it almost became, this is why I think I was probably, probably too embedded, became as beautiful as Titian's to me. They were absolutely works of art. Forget your Villa Destes and all that sort of stuff. To me, these were wonderful drawings of the quintessential suburban gardens at the time that you can see. And they really are redolent and rich with historical context and meaning, I think. Um, note the crazy paving here. Um, uh, crazy paving. This is, of course, a time when all these uh, gardens needed labour-saving gardens. People, you know, the gardens of, of, of Jekyll and, and, and Robinson were, were not, not for these people. Had to be labour-saving, um, which would have uh, Sudell in trouble with some of the RHS vanguard later on. I often see Richard Sudell as the patron saint of crazy paving, by the way. Those straight lines and delineated spaces which meant that they were um, uh, labour-saving. And just incidentally, as a little coda to that, Richard Sudell's main book is 1933's Landscape Gardening. And in the foreword, the RHS's Sir William Lawrence in his foreword writes, crazy paving is bad enough, but intolerable when stuck over little plants and looking like Galantine. On page 114 of the same book, Sudell himself is saying, crazy paving can form a charming semi-formal pathway. I wonder who ended up being right. And if you don't believe me about those books, look at this one here. I mean, this is a, this is a quote from um, Susan Yehanke, who is a book art uh, lecturer in London, at the University of London, um, who calls it a medieval manuscript, a complete work in itself. And what you see here is one of his books, Practical Garden and Food Production in Pictures, a beautiful before and after picture of time during rationing of a garden that might be before rationing and a garden afterwards. And you see chicken coops coming in, always really interested in kitchen gardens and, and fruit trees at the back of the houses so that people can food themselves. And by the way, just quickly, I'm not saying that Richard Sudell was anywhere doing this himself. Of course, there were an explosion of uh, instruction books and things, but Richard was by far and away the most prolific in terms of publication of books. But of course, just to give you some context, this, this is a little man called Strube in the Daily Express, which was an ongoing cartoon. And what you see here is that explosion, which, you know, no time to go in here about suburban and Metroland, which of course started that huge debate, which you, Many of you in this uh, room will know much better than I am, I do, about the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of ridicule that suburbanites and, and, and suburban aspiration started to get, and for which Richard Sudell was, 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 was undoubtedly uh, wrapped up in and tarnished with. So, you know, the modern movement of Le Corbusier and, and, and anti-suburbanites came together, really, to start to damn these things. And um, in David Mattis's excellent book, you know, he describes these people like Strube on the left here as the sort of modest, garden-concerned, and commonsensical suburban male. And that was not a compliment about the males of those times. Of course, the modernists wanted dynamic new communal cities, not privatised spaces, the ribbon development encroaching on rural idyll. The gardens that Sudell was telling people to do summed up all of which they hated. But remember about that turmoil, you know, uh, seclusion from the turmoil, uh, you know, excluded from the turmoil of the day and the strains of every, everyday life. This was the background of the debate that was swirling at that time. And it was at swirling at that time when uh, Richard Sudell uh, became a member of um, the ILA. In this picture here, which many of you have probably seen before, Richard Sudell sits at the front there. And uh, in the letters you'll see later on in a, in, in a minute, you can see Jeffrey Jellicoe sitting next to him. Kind of, <laughs> now Annabelle says this can't be right, but, but the, Richard looks like he's veering away from, uh, sorry, uh, Jeffrey looks like he's veering away from Richard a bit there. And some of the letters that passed between them were quite, uh, quite passionate, but I'm sure that's not the case. This is, um, 
Uh, this is a meeting of the ILA and Town Planning Institute in 1934. And that quote I'm showing you there, I think is part of the, uh, of the issue with uh, Richard Sudell and, and why he disappeared from, from the history. Just very quickly, um, Sudell was the founder of the ILA, I, I would submit, and Geoffrey Jellicoe said that himself, uh, that, that he'd done excellently, I think, to get this thing on, off the ground. And again, Annabelle's uh, research has shown that um, at the ILA RHS uh, International Exhibition of Garden Design and Conference in, uh, on Garden Planning in 1928, um, Sudell, among others, uh, um, saw that, that, or feared, that, that British gardening and garden, you know, was behind the Europeans and realized and started to think about some kind of association that needed to come together to, um, to, 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 to start to think about best practice and, and, and to start to agitate for a reimagined Britain. And Sudell saw that, and that's what he doesn't get credit for. Um, he was elected chairman of the British Association of Garden Architects in his Gower Street offices. So the first meeting was in his offices in Gower Street, just around the corner from where I did all my study. Um, but by the end of the year, he was overthrown um, uh, and architects had come elbowing horticulturists out, more people coming with more kudos. Um, and it was definitely the gardeners who took a, a bit of a beating. And that quote is from Geoffrey. Jellicoe, uh, where Gilbert Jen Je Jenkins said, we must get Thomas Morton in and Sudell out of the chair. Um, and that is in fact what happened before the year was out. Um, so this is a letter from uh, the, the, the archive at, uh, at Merle. Um, and, and Richard didn't give up the fight. The passion that he brought from Roehampton, the passion that he brought from the First World War, his politics, saw him the archive's not big on Richard Sudell, certainly not bigger than, than, than others, but what you start to see is these letters that keep pushing Geoffrey Jellicoe when he was president. This is now back going into the Second World War. Um, to, 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 to rebuild Britain, to change it. Um, uh, the, and what he saw as well, and it wasn't the only one, but what he did see and what is clear in the archive is he saw that the that, that public sector would need to come to a body to help the rebuilding and the reimagining of Britain. And Sudell was right there and understood this. Um, uh, you know, he wanted it built around egalitarian lines. Everything was, um, everything was under the scope of the, everything under the open sky, he said, was, 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 was the subject for that. Aerodromes, road verges, petrol stations, the utopian dream of the Garden City movement as well. He earlier described Roehampton, by the way, as being a little garden city, which he, he wanted. Um, he's, he, he, these letters show him railing against the possible appointment of Lord Reith, who he hated as a bogeyman for the left and didn't, and didn't think he was a landscape architect. Hated the fact the Road Beautification Society wanted to get involved in roads. They have no landscape architect, he said. They should not have nothing to do with it. And, 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 and Geoffrey Jellicoe largely sat back and took these letters from, from, from Richard Sudell. Richard Sudell wasn't made even president of the, um, of, the, of the ILA until 1955, which I think, which says something. And also he did get quite a bit of um, uh, uh, fire from, from, from people in the ILA himself. And of course, his style of suburban gardens was really coming under attack here. Peter Youngman, who was a president himself, called landscape gardening utterly useless. Um, and in a speech later on to commemorate Thomas Mawson, in an open conversation, um, when someone had raised Richard Sudell's name, said, well, yeah, but Richard Sudell was not really of a very, very high order. Um, and even in Richard Sudell was the editor of Landscape and Garden, which is the ILA's uh, magazine, was it for a long time because of his journalism. Even in there, there was a review of his book, Landscape Gardening, uh, which the reviewer sniffily says, it's a shame there are, um, you know, there are too many crazy paving examples and not enough concrete and glass, as we'd like to see. And I think you start to see there where, where uh, Sudell was, 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 was positioned. I want to quickly take you through um, these, these the three examples of gardens very quickly. This is a drawing in Richard Sell's uh, brochure about um, uh, Dolphin Square, which, as I say, it's really important that we, in my view, uh, 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 that, we, that we do all we can to save this last remaining. It's a 3.5 acre garden, uh, three gardens, <coughs> excuse me, huge uh, thing for, for Richard to help. Excuse me, I'm just going to take a glass of water. Um, um, a fount so that it starts at the end by the Grove and a Road through that 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 um, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me uh, through the Horse Chestnuts up through the Fountain Garden through a Loggia and into a, another garden and on the side are really idiosyncratic in the in the alcoves there it, very idiosyncratic little uh, specialist gardens Dutch Japanese Italian there is what you see in this garden I think is 
exactly suburban gardens of that time coming to play here, in my view, and my 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 um, my, my my view is that everywhere you look, there are delineated spaces, lots of almost crazy things going on. It's very idiosyncratic. There is that there are different eye lines, different eyesights, and 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 lots of stuff going on. But it does absolutely give you, um, as as Richard says himself, um, and as he said in this brochure here. It, you are, they are designed to make you forget you are in the centre of a great city. And anyone who's been there, even today, will know that how this building and, and these gardens shut out the noise of, 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 of London. And of course, everywhere you see our old friend, the tranquility and relief from the turmoil of the day. That's Dolphin Square. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised that no one ever mentions that um, uh, Richard was partnering um, Marjorie Allen on the Self Selfridges Roof Garden in 1930. Um, incredible achievement and massively successful, as many of you probably know. Um, 18 inches of topsoil brought up through the lifts before the shop opened. They maintained it for three years uh, before Marjorie, in a, in, a, in a lovely autobiography, talks about um, then, then, then self just starting to bring up all kinds of other god watery, as she calls it, into thing to start impinging on this garden. Uh, Richard and uh, her went to Selvages and said, look, if you, you've got to choose us or the gnomes or we go, uh, Selfridges, you probably all know, chose the gnomes, and that was it. But um, but Richard Sudell was involved in that. Aerodromes were a big thing in Richard Sudell's life. Nobody, it's hardly anybody knows what, what the work he did. And I'm not claiming, by the way, that this work, and I, I don't have the expertise to claim it, but, but I don't claim that this work is, um, his work is exemplary. I just think it's very of, the, of its time and very serves to its purpose. This is the de Havilland uh, um, headquarters at Hatfield um, and what you see here quite rarely is, is, is from the air the beginning of his garden in front of de Havilland headquarters I mean without going into the history of aviation which I won't do Richard Sudell said to people look it's really important that landscape architects are involved in aerodromes because everyone will be able to see, there'll be explosion of flights and everyone will be able to see our mistake from the air so we must make it right and he did this landscape garden for the de Havilland, the preeminent aircraft people at the time. And you can see a very formal garden there. Um, uh, uh, these all taken by de Havilland at the time. Um, quite a lot of different influences coming on Richard there. You know, the garden was used to complement this Art Deco streamline modern building. And where Richard Sudell used to say everything should have an eye line out into the garden from the windows, what Richard Sudell designed here was a garden looking into the building to fag up the prestigious nature and of both de Havilland and the building itself. It's in a very, very, but when you look at how we do with the sight lines of this one at night time, you can see just how he complemented the buildings and how he's growing skills as a garden um, um, architect, landscape architect, sorry, were, were, were coming to the fore. Um, that, that garden, by the way, is in a real state now. Just very quickly again, um, I'm debted to David Lambert for this sort of stuff. I, I, this, this is another eureka moment. This, this, this drawing by Richard Sudell is at the City of London Cemetery. It was done in 1953 in his original Sudell drawing um, of his memorial garden, um, formal uh, 10 acre memorial garden, surrounded, if you know the City of London Memorial, by huge Victorian ostentatious um, uh, um, uh, 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 plots, telling how wonderful these people were. And suddenly in 1953, as cremations obviously were building, um, you see this incredible garden. Um, uh, that, 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 that Richard Sudell designs. Cemeteries were really important for Richard Sudell. And you see these lovely drawings, they're right in the back office, just tucked away actually in a, in a drawer of the things he was doing. This is a crazy garden that he was trying to, I mean, idiosyncratic, I keep using, but this fantastic checkerboard, the Rose Garden. What he saw cemeteries were was a space in inner cities where people could go regardless of whether they were grieving. or not. It was an open space that the working classes needed. Um, and, and that's a sort of picture of that checkerboard, which is still there to this day. Um, and as I say, he saw cemeteries as green spaces. He even started to say that actually, you know, ashes burial shouldn't take place because we don't have the space and we'll be overtaking food production. And this is that, th these are very typical. And actually, if you go around the city of London, this Sudell thing is kind of plonked from out of space on, on a, 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 it's very, very fascinating. And I, I do recommend a, 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 a victory. Uh, sorry, a, 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 um, a, a visit. Um, so I, I suppose just in summation, I've probably gone on too long now. I, I think my view on it is that um, he is the forgotten man of, of landscape history. I, I think his, 
his name is largely missing from historical accounts of the time. And I think he's overdue uh, a restoration. And the reason I think that is because it was a pivotal moment in British garden history as societal changes ushered at a time when land, no matter how, how small, became available to the many, not the few. I think in those suburban gardens themselves, in the pages of the newspapers and the magazines, uh, wrote, and within letters and meetings connected to that newly professionalized landscape architectural movement, which he did so much to do, uh, to, to bring about. Sudell's words and as importantly actions show how key a figure he was in advocating the demo democratization of the land and the beautification of the Britain for the majority. Um, and as I say, to, 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 to find refuge in the strains of the everyday life. Politics can't be separated, of course it can't. It never can in, in garden history, of course. And he lived in a time when, when in interwar, when demands for an egalitarian society were heightened. And obviously many took to soapbox and politics to do this. But Sudell planted trees. He showed the working class how to sow for all year round colour, lay their crazy paving to save labour, and argued that roadside cemeteries and any open space could be uplifting experiences for the population. It, it, his work is of its time. I say I, I don't argue for the merit of it particularly. He was not a modernist, and for that he was associated with all the conservative connotations that came with the suburban gardener. Yet I say that is to overlook the radicalism of what he was doing, that gentle cajoling of millions of people to create their own spaces and understand the rhythms of the season, to grow their own food, create their own environments. And having lived that experience, I think Sudo understood exactly what those small suburban gardens meant to residents in a way any number of theorists and modern, modern movement advocates simply could not. His style of garden and landscape became a associated obviously with suburban conformity but i think it can be obviously argued in the postmodern world such gardens together with perhaps arts and crafts movement still hold sway in britain today perhaps because they do the same things that richard Sudell knew they did at the time and just in 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 conclusion i would say that 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 would be my conclusion that's on the screen there um you know i i think he's there he doesn't necessarily he's not leading the field in any way but his history his life his, his, his activities show that he is absolutely uh, in the right place and, and richly rewards study uh, that, that uh, hitherto I, I don't think has been done enough of.